Okay, awesome, perfect. Um, so I wanted to do a quick introduction and just an overview before we get this, um, before I turn it over to Mr. Akil Parker, aka CEO of All This Math. Um, we wanted to host this workshop because a lot of families said, I don't understand this new math and it's just too much for me, but I still have to make sure that my kids get their homework done. And so what we want to do as always at the Y is we want to bring resources that allow you to be a better parent, to be um, better as a family, and then just, just to support your scholars in general. And so today what you'll be doing is you'll have the workshop um, with Mr. Akil. He'll be walking you guys through pro uh, problems for every single grade from K, first, second, third, fourth, and fifth. And we have one problem for each. Um, so I recommend you can bring even some paper and pencil to work it out with yourselves or even um, your scholars too. And then if you have questions, you also can feel free to ask questions. We ask that everybody puts their name in the chat just so we can make sure that we um keep track. Oh, there we go. Um, making sure that we can keep track of everyone as well. And then um, if you have questions, that way he can know um, your specific name so he can know who he's he's calling as well. Um, so we want to say thank you again for everybody joining. Um, we will also have a survey at the end that you just complete, and then that allows you to be entered into the raffle. So we'll send a, um, an email out to the raffle winner um, by next week after everyone has completed the survey. So thank you guys so much. And I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Akil. And I'll turn my camera off and I'll let people in. So thank you guys again. So good evening. Good evening. Good evening. It's good to meet all of you. Um, I'm glad you showed up. You know, um, <laughs> I was concerned that, you know, people might be a little turned off since it was math. But um, you're in the right place because this is not, you know, meant to be painful. You know, it's meant to actually be fun, you know, if it's done properly. You know, if I achieve my goal, my goal is for this to be a fun experience and for you to, you know, learn some new things and really to gain some confidence, you know, and the ability to understand math a little differently. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to I have a PowerPoint presentation, but most I'm not just going to sit back and just talk, you know, and read slides. What I'm going to do is actually work out some problems. But, you know, I'm going to talk a little bit. So what I want to do is first share my screen and use the PowerPoint presentation as a background, so to speak, for the presentation. Um, let's do this. Here we go. Share my screen. Okay, cool. All right, yeah, so the, the and I like this title. I like this title. Um, I didn't choose this title, but I like it, though. Um, old math versus new math. And I like it for a couple of reasons. One reason is that, um, you know, it, it exposes, it, it gives us an opportunity to have the conversation around, you know, some things. And because I actually think, you know, new math is kind of a misnomer um, because what the so-called new, there are new methods that are being used. Like I remember when I was in, you know, elementary school at Roland Park and, you know, a lot of things that, you know, my daughter is doing, I live in Philly now, you know, I've been in Philadelphia since I graduated from college. But, um, you know, even my nephews that live in Baltimore, you know, when I see the work that they're doing, I didn't learn that type of stuff um, while I was there. Now, fortunately for me, when the so-called new math or the common core math was introduced, I wasn't a big fan of it. You know, I was kind of like a lot of people, I, you know, I pushed back on it, but because just because it was different and required work, you know, to really learn it. But I had to learn it because I teach at Cheney. I teach at Cheney University, first HBCU um, in Pennsylvania. Um, founded in 1837 in South Philly. And, you know, I teach education majors. So I've been charged with learning the new math and not only learning it myself, I learn it so that I can teach it to teachers and hopefully they'll understand it. So that way when they have, you know, the babies and the young people in their classrooms, they'll be able to then teach it properly to them, you know? Um, so that's, that's where, that's where I am. Um, so yeah, so welcome. Um, just I just want to give a little bit of background, just so you, you know a little bit about me. Um, this presentation really isn't about me; it's really about the math. So I was raised in Baltimore. Went like I mentioned earlier, I went to Roland Park. I went to then I went to Poly, then I went to Morgan State, and that's where I graduated from. I got my bachelor's degree, and then I left Baltimore, moved to Philly, became a high school teacher. Years later, I ended up going to Lincoln and getting a master's degree in, in education. Um, I taught high school math in traditional classrooms in Philly for over 15 years. Um, like I mentioned, I've been teaching at Cheney for the last five years. Prior to teaching at Cheney, I taught at LaSalle University. Actually, I was teaching at LaSalle 
which is in Philly, um, and Cheney simultaneously. You know, now I just I'm more fo- I just focus on Cheney right now and also building my company, all this math. Um, currently, I'm also teaching. I'm still teaching high school technically, but I teach in some virtual independent schools. You know, read that are based in different parts of the country. Um, just still teaching math because I really I really love math. I've really developed I've developed a love for math more recently. I haven't loved math my whole life. You know, I've kind of tolerated and appreciated math for most of my life. But in the last few years, I would say in the last five years, I've developed a, a actual love for math. So it's a little it's a little different now. Um, and the reason is because I understand it conceptually. You know, I understand the concepts behind math. You know, when I was younger, math was, you know, I was, you know, I, I got good grades. You know, I was one of those students. You know, I was expected to get good grades. Um, my father was a teacher. So, you know, I didn't want to embarrass him. And, you know, he was kind of stern. So I wanted to make sure that I was always on point in terms of my studies and my academics. But um, to me, math was a lot like video games. It really was just, you know, I would learn algorithms. I would learn the processes that I would learn. I would learn the procedures. I would figure out how to get to the answer, how to memorize the formula and get to the answer and then just to go on to the next problem. But if you ask me why it worked, I couldn't really tell you. I had no idea. I just know how to get the answer. I don't know why it's the, why it works every time. I don't know, you know, how it works or how it's supposed to work, but I just know how to get the answer. So, but that causes a problem because when you see those standardized tests, oftentimes they're testing you not on just knowing the algorithm on how or how well you can memorize an algorithm, but they're testing you on your understanding of the basic concepts. Because if you understand the basic concept, then you can figure stuff out, even if you haven't memorized the procedure or haven't memorized the algorithm. So that's where I would get caught up. Um, and also that would be a source of frustration sometimes because when I was in a math, if I was in a math class where I had to, you know, I had to present, you know, the I had to show that I understood the concept and I couldn't, then, you know, I wouldn't do well, you know, at that particular point in time in those classes. Um, also, I mentioned I started a company called All This Math and All This Math is a tutoring company. So I offer private tutoring, individual tutoring, group tutoring in math. I focus only on math. I, have, I don't do any of the other subjects at this point. Um, and we also started a YouTube channel. So I definitely want everybody to make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel. It's called All This Math. And we currently have over 640 videos right now, uh, ranging from arithmetic. So you got, you know, different addition methods, a lot of the new math, you know, the, um, the so-called new math. Um, I have some Eureka math playlists for different grades. I plan to have a lot of all the Eureka content at some point, but I have some some Eureka videos at this point, but I'm adding content on a regular basis. But I go all the way from arithmetic all the way up to calculus. So no matter what the grade level, even for adult learners, college students, um, adults going back to school after many years, you know, because that's who I really I really want to I want to I want this to be a resource so that math is not going to be the uh, the barrier towards success, whether it's for a child, whether it's for an adult, whether it's for somebody's grandma, grandpa, uncle, whoever. Right. Somebody's trying to go back to school because a lot of people I've encountered, you know, that I've even tutored adult learners that I've tutored. Um, they've wanted to go back to school, but it's always the math. You know, the math is like held them up, you know, so. I create a lot of video content, hopefully to kind of show you that the math is not that hard, you know, and I try to explain it in certain ways where I make it make sense, you know. Um, so that's the that's the YouTube channel. Um, and, you know, I'm a father of three and my youngest son, Kwame, actually lives actually lives in Baltimore, Smith, but majority of his time in Baltimore, if he's not in Philly with me um, and he'll be attending Northwood Elementary next year as a kindergarten student. Um, what is math? So let's get let's get to some basics. Uh, what is math? I know that kind of seems like a strange question, like it seems so obvious what math is, but I like to start off things with definitions. So math is a language relying on recogn- recognizable patterns in nature used to solve problems. So the big thing for me with math is math is about problem solving, because that's what it's really about. Now, a lot of times, even in my own career, early as a teacher, I didn't do really a good job explaining to my students what math really was. So a lot of my students were kind of like me. They kind of were just very focused on, okay, the problem that was on the board or the problem that was in the textbook or the problem that was on the worksheet. And they weren't able to see the connection to everyday life. But sometimes like the specific problem is not necessarily as connected to everyday life, but it's really about practicing and developing your thinking so that you can solve problems, right? So that you can recognize problems, so you can understand problems when you see them. So you'll have a systematic way to solve the problem, right? Because a lot of us, if we don't have a systematic way to solve a problem, 
All we're going to do is get mad and start cussing somebody out. And a lot of times that's not really helpful. Right. Um, so math, it kind of trains us in terms of how to think, you know, how to think and being able to think. So so I see math as a life skill, because if you think about it, if you can't solve your if you have a problem and you can't solve it, that problem doesn't go away. But on its own, that problem lingers and it remains. And then that can be that can have very serious negative consequences for us. So really, math is a life skill because problem solving ability is a life skill. And one of the things that's happening also while you're, you're developing your math skills is you are developing your critical thinking ability. You're learning how to think about situations. You're learning how to understand things. And that's a great way to prevent yourself from ever being scammed by somebody. Because, uh, you know, a lot because oftentimes the scammers will try to prey on people that they recognize don't have that critical thinking ability. So this is another way that, like, you know, math is very valuable. Now, new math. Now, I mentioned a little bit about new math a little earlier. So new math is a term used to describe the modern methods of teaching and using math that are focused more on building conceptual understanding, like I mentioned earlier, as opposed to only the memorization of algorithms such as long division. Now, I love long division. You know, I remember learning long division back in the day, and I felt really good about myself when I when I learned long division. I like teaching long division when I when I teach algebra two and I teach polynomial long division, algebra, you know, long division with with algebraic expressions. I enjoy it. I like it. But there are other methods of dividing that are very helpful. And actually. This is why I say new math is kind of a misnomer or like an inappropriate term to describe it in reality, because what the other methods do is. It shows you why those old methods, that so-called old methods that we learned, it shows it shows you why those work, and they're very interconnected. So it's kind of like it, it kind of just breaks them down and simplifies them. So that's some of the some of what we're going to do tonight, and the, and a lot of the reasons why, like a lot of your children are seeing these different methods, is because if it's taught properly, your children will have more more numerical fluency, more mathematical fluency. They'll just understand numbers because again, math is a language, right? So if you think about in the English language, the more you speak, the more you read, the more you like have conversations with people, the more you like, you know, embrace, you know, more advanced vocabulary, it helps you become more fluent with the English language, right? Or any language that you may be practicing. The same thing holds true with math, right? So if you practice more math, if you use different methods to solve math problems, you'll become more fluent with math, right? So that's basically, that's basically what happens. Um, and there are benefits of new, there are also or more benefits. Like, for example, one of the things that I noticed early on when I was studying it so that I could teach, you know, college students and education majors was that because the majority of my career, I always taught high school. So then I'm looking at these methods of how math is being taught on the elementary level. And I'm saying, wow, wait a minute. This is like algebra. These are like the algebra methods. OK, so they're being so the young people in the first grade and second grade of being introduced to things that I teach in algebra one and algebra two classes, right? The methods and the ways in which we're like, you know, manipulating numbers and, you know, moving numbers around, you know, and not just, you know, in terms of math, but even when we deal with number bonds. So if you have a kindergarten or a first grader or a second grader, and they might be doing work with number bonds, think of it like this. When that, when your child goes to chemistry class, they're going to be given um, molecules, Right. They're going to have to break down molecules into separate atoms and, you know, and, and, and whatnot and separate components. So understanding the number bond is really an introduction and a preparation for chemistry, even if they don't take a chemistry class until 10th grade. Right. They're being exposed to that early on. So that foundation is being laid for them. So that way, when they go into the chemistry class, <coughs> excuse me, it'll be more comfortable. Because that's what makes students often uncomfortable a lot of the time is that they're being like overwhelmed and bombarded with information that they've never seen before. Right. And it's like it's too much, like it's too much, you know, information that they haven't been exposed to. So that's another benefit of it. Um, and another thing I like to say is like in terms of like the newer math methods where we're given we're introduced to different, you know, methods of solving problems. I kind of think about it like this, like we should want our children to have multiple methods for solving problems. Just like we should want to have multiple multiple ways to get home, you know, because when you find like a street is blocked off, so the normal way you go home, you can't go that way, right? So it's beneficial if you know a different way, right? Um, or people often talk about having multiple streams of income, right? So 
I look at it like, you know, we want our children to have multiple streams of problem solving. Right. So and like I said, like, you know, this is this is not this is meant to be a, a fun workshop um, where we can learn some things, you know, and uh, hopefully just feel, hopefully feel more confident, because even if if you develop more confidence as parents or, you know, as, as guardians, grandparents, uncles, aunts, whoever, um, then when your child when the child comes home with something that you have never seen before, if you have that confidence, then you'll feel like, you know what, let's really look into this. Let's read this. Let me. I I, I believe that I can figure this out, because that's the last half of the battle right there. Just believe the belief that you can figure it out. Because when when we don't believe that we can figure it out, then you know it makes you not even want to try. And that's just human nature, you know. Like I'm guilty of that sometimes, you know. So I want. I hope that you know we go over some of these problems, and I'm gonna be you know drawn on my screen, and you know hopefully you can you can draw you can play along so to speak. <laughs> um. You know, you'll you'll definitely you know feel that more feel more confidence. So also here's another thing I want to say too. So I'm gonna go over problems from each grade level. But I don't want you to feel like, well, you know, like for example, this slide says kindergarten and first grade. Definitely don't feel like, well, my child's in the fifth grade, so this don't apply to me. My child's in the fourth grade, so this don't apply to me. The math is cumulative. Everything builds on the previous year, right? So even if your child is in the fifth grade, understanding these concepts, these number bond concepts. They're going to be using number bond concepts in the fifth grade too, right? They just might, they just might be using larger numbers. So it's all so it's it's all good basically is what I'm trying to say. It's all helpful. It's all beneficial, right? Commutative property is an example. The second bullet point you see on the screen, that's something that you know we always teach in algebra one, like the first the first week of school, the first two weeks of school. The properties, commutative property, associative property, distributive property, right? So I never knew years ago how beneficial the use of commutative property was just in arithmetic, right? But I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you. So um, let's, uh, I'm going to go to the next slide. And I got some examples up here, right? So let's say the first bullet point says add three plus two using a number bond. All right, so a number bond, um, there's a couple ways to write number bonds. So usually you'll have a circle and then you'll have, and this also sets the students up for factoring. Helps me become more confident with factoring, right? So here's a number bond, right? Now, the three and the two are, are called add-ins. They're the add-ins, right? We're looking for our sum. Now, at this point, now your child's in kindergarten probably, they're probably still counting with their fingers. And that's fine for now. You want them to memorize their addition facts as soon as possible, though. But the only way to do that, really, is just through practice. Through practice on a regular basis, a daily basis, Right? And then also what helps is like finding like different ways, like or different teachable moments, like in the house, you know, like in the car, you know, random times when you can like test them on like, you know, what three plus two is or, you know, what six plus four is or what, you know, five plus one is, you know, different different things like that. Um, I also wrote a book that I'll tell you all about that has a that's full of examples like that, you know, um, where I'm meeting people where they are and showing them how you can take this everyday activity that you do. And then use that to help, you know, develop arithmetic skills and algebra skills as well. As well, I'll tell you that later. So anyway, this number bond, right? So three plus two, and typically your parent, your, your children, not parents, your children will be using the count on method. So you, the teachers probably talk about the count on method. So you start with one number, let's say three, and you count on from three using your hands, right? So you might go, okay, and you you're adding two. So you go from three, and you go four, five, right? And the number bond is just a way of showing the information, right? That's just, all, that's all that is. It's a way of showing the information. So you will put a five up here, right? So that's three, that's three, three and two is five, okay? Now, also we got to keep in mind that like, and this is something I tell my students all the time. It's like, we, we often take for granted that, you know, this is easy, right? But to a young child that isn't as fluent, haven't, hasn't been on earth as long, it three plus two may not be that easy for them, right? So, the number bond is also a tool that they can use to kind of be able to not only conceptualize the problem, but also to visualize it and kind of see, okay, because you see, okay, when I put three and two together, oh, I see this, it's a five, it makes five all together. Oh, okay, I get it now, you know? Sometimes it's about seeing it, you know? Now, the next bullet point, rewrite, rewrite one plus nine using commutative property and solve the equation. Now, first of all, like, what's the purpose of this? 
why use the community? First of all, what's the community property? And then why use it? The community property just says that when we're doing addition, and it also works for multiplication, by the way, it doesn't apply to division and subtraction, but when we're doing addition, if we switch the order of the numbers, our sum is not going to change. So basically, that's just a fancy way to say one plus nine is going to give me 10, just like nine plus one is going to give me 10. Now, why would that be beneficial for a child? Because we talked about the count on method, right? So counting on, let's say we start at one. And then I got to count on and I got to add nine to that. So if I'm counting with my fingers, right, I got to go from one and I go, OK, I got to put up nine fingers. First of all, that's a lot. That's a lot. And when, when you're adding a lot of numbers, there's a lot of opportunities to make mistakes. So we want to minimize the amount of opportunities to make mistakes, especially for a child that is really just developing, starting to develop their numerical fluency. Right. So if I go from one, then I got to go two, three, four, five. And then I'm and then I'm, I'm counting and then I'm thinking, OK, do I have not how many fingers I got up? And then you can lose count real easily and things like that. So what you do is with the commutative property is you flip it around. So it starts out as one plus nine, but we know that that's equal to nine plus one. That's all That's all the commutative property means. You're just flipping the numbers around, right? You're flipping the numbers around. And now, so if now that child, if, you, if they count counting on using the count on method with their hands and counting with their fingers, now they're starting at nine and they only got to go, they got to only add one. So they go nine, 10, and they're done. They got one finger up. So that's the benefit of the commutative property. Now, again, and of course, when the child gets older, they get into algebra, they're going to be using the commutative property a lot more, right? Because it's going to be even more beneficial. Um, real quick, uh, find two equivalent expressions to four plus three. Let's talk about that. So what that means, again, with developing fluency. And a lot of the things that your children are going to be doing in kindergarten and first grade are things that they're not going to be doing in second grade because by that time, they should have their addition facts memorized, right? So these are tools that they're going to use until they get their addition facts memorized, right? So, but it help, but it helps them to understand the concept of numbers and the relationships between numbers. Like knowing that, for example, an equivalent expression to four plus three. So if your child knows that four plus three is equal to seven, then you can say, well, I know four plus three is equivalent to five plus two, right? But it's, it's good for them to visualize that because they also can see that, well, I know that because they might be confused at first and say, well, four is not the same as five and three is not the same as two. So how can these be equivalent expressions? Because it's about the sum, the sum, the total amount on each side of the equal sign. So on the left side, you got seven because four plus three is seven. And on the right side, you got seven because five plus two is seven. All right. All right. So let's move on. Let's move on um, from kindergarten. And first grade, let's go to second grade. All right, this okay. These are some of my favorites. The make a 10 method for addition, the make a 10 method for subtraction. All right, let me clear my writing or clear my drawings. All right, so seven plus eight. So now, and this, and this involves um, using uh, number bonds, right? So if we got seven plus eight, let's do this. Let's do seven plus eight. And this is how I teach my students this, my education majors, that is. So make a 10 method, because again, we, we're, we, we use a base 10 number system where everything is based on 10. That's why we go from, you know, a dollar, $10, $100, $1,000, right? Everything is based on 10. And even when we deal with place value or we, uh, you know, we get to the, to the cents, you know, we go 10 cent, um, hundreds, you know, Point 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 one, uh, point oh one, point oh right? Everything is base ten. So ten is helpful to use ten because ten ends in zero. The number ten ends in zero. The number one hundred ends in zero. Number thousand ends in zero. And that makes the math easier because it gives you less to less to manipulate and less to have to add. So right now I got seven plus eight. Now granted, once your child memorizes that seven plus eight is fifteen, this is not going to be relevant. But until they get to that point, we have different methods to help them understand. The relationships between these numbers. So when we say make a 10, I can, you know, take, I can think to myself, well, what would I have to add to seven to make it 10? I would have to add three. Okay. That's the first question. Now, the second question is where, where am I get this three from? 
we're going to get it from the eight. So what we do is we break the eight down into three and some other number. So we also got to know, well, three plus what equals eight? So I know that three plus five equals eight. So I make a 10 with the seven and the three, with the seven and the three. So that's why it's called the make a 10 method. A lot of the methods that the teachers will be sending home with your children, they have names for a specific reason. Part of the battle is understanding like why it's called that. So a lot of times, once we understand why it's called that, then it, things get a lot easier. So I make a 10 with the seven and the three. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna circle the seven and the three. That's gonna give me my 10. And now this is, this is why it's easier now. Cause now I'm doing 10 plus that five that's left over. And we can think about it like this. We can treat 10 almost the way we treat zero by just counting up from zero. If I count up from zero, that's like doing zero plus five. We know that's five. So 10 plus five, there's going to be a five in the, in the ones place, but there's still that one in the tens place. So we know from counting, we can count with our fingers and do 10 plus five. We can do the count on method, right? And we end up with 15. So that's the make a 10 method for addition. All right. Real quick, the make a 10 method for subtraction, though. So I'm trying to do 13, take away five, right? So what I do is I break I break 13 down into 10 plus three, right? You always want, so you when you're doing subtraction, you take the bigger number and you break it down into 10 plus whatever other number will create that number. So here I need a 10, so 10 plus three will give me 13. So I got 10 and three. So now how does this help me? So now what I'm gonna do is instead of doing 13 minus five, I'm going to do 10 minus 5. And with that, we can just count backwards and we can get 5. Right? Now, that's not the final answer, though, because this 3 is still here. So this is a little, I mean, this gets a little complicated, you know, but because now we got to do addition. It's kind of like we got to combine and subtract. We're trying to subtract, but we got to end up doing subtraction and addition in order to get the answer. So we got we take this five and then we add three to it. And again, a lot of this stuff becomes easy with practice. So it's not the type of thing where the first time you see it, you know, it's going to be like, you know, it's going to click and be easy. You know, you might have to do a few problems. So that's how you get eight. That's how you get the difference of eight. Right. And of course, the term difference. You know, that, that describes our result whenever we're doing subtraction. All right. So we got five and three is eight. All right. So let me, um, let's go on to the next page. And let me clear my drawings. Okay. Using, okay. We get into the third grade now. All right. Third grade. Using number bonds. Like, so, like I said, when you get to third grade, we still use the number bonds, but we can use number bonds to do division. Well, so it's being taught this way. I like, I'm glad you asked that question. I see a question in the chat. Why is it being taught this way? It's being taught this way to increase fluency for a lot of reasons, right? To, to one, increase fluency, right? And it's, everything is going to be complicated when they first see it. When anybody first sees it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to seem complicated, right? But when you practice it, then it gets easier. It gets more like second nature, right? Especially when you understand, it helps you see the relationship between numbers. And what it also does, is it prepares you for algebra. It's preparing your children for algebra because I've taught hundreds of students over the years that have said to me, yeah, you know, Mr. Parker, you know, I, I really used to like math until they put the letters in it. Once they put the letters in it, I ain't like it no more, right? And I've thought about that comment over the years because I've heard it so much and I realized that there's like a disconnect between the arithmetic and the algebra. So these methods also are, they're basically algebraic methods. So it's like a, it's like a way of teaching a simplified form of algebra at a younger age, right? Plus, you know, I'm of I'm of the um. Right, right. Wait, how do you know which number to use for the number bond for? Um, how do you know which number? So that's a good question. That's a good question. You could use either one. I'm glad somebody said that. You could use either one. 
typically you use the bigger number, right? Because with the bigger number, now I use seven just because seven was written on the left, right? Well, actually, well, I broke the eight down. So I used eight because eight was eight was written on the on the right. And I wanted to put it with the first number. But we could have did it the other way. I could have broke the seven down into five and two. And then I would have put the two with the eight to make 10. So you have the option, right? And that's another thing as well. Like as your children progress through their math classes, definitely encourage them to take risks and take chances and, you know, use their options, right? A lot of times, I mean, I had a lot of teachers growing up that kind of taught, taught my classes in a way where, you know, this is the one way to do it. And if you don't do it this one way, then it's wrong. And that creates problems because sometimes that one way is not the most efficient way. And sometimes that one way doesn't work all the time, especially when you get to algebra class, algebra one, algebra two, you know, that one way may not work or that one way may work, but it may not be as efficient and it may require you to do a whole lot more work than you necessarily need to. Right. I hear you. I hear you. All right. So we're in third, we're in third grade now, right? Number bonds for partial quotients. Let me go on to the next slide. So we're going to do 54 divided by six. And of course, so 54 divided by six is a division fact. So, and this is one thing I recommend to everybody. Have your children memorize the multiplication facts as soon as possible and as early as possible. Have them memorized, right? Once they know the multiplication facts, they should also at the same time, they'll also understand the division facts. Because if they know that six times nine equals 54, they'll also know that nine times six equals 54. So if they understand the relationship between multiplication and division, then they should also have memorized that 54 divided by six is equal to nine. Just like 54 divided by nine is equal to six. So definitely have them memorize, do everything in your power to try to make sure your, your children have the division facts and the multiplication facts memorized as soon as possible. But prior to that, there is different, there's a method where we can use number bonds to use something called partial quotients. And partial quotients gets more complex. I believe in the fourth grade, partial quotients are introduced as an alternative to the long division method. And, you know, partial quotients was something that I never learned when I was in elementary school. All I learned, I just learned long division. I thought that was the only way to divide, just do long division. Right. And then I, I see partial quotients and, you know, it was a little it was a little challenging at first, but then I figured it out. I kind of caught the rhythm of it and I said, oh, OK, that makes sense. Now, this is not, you know, a complex form of partial quotients. This is more like just breaking division, a division problem down into two separate division problems. So watch this. We got 54 divided by six. Right. So first we write that. 54 divided by six. And the division problem is, you know, another way to express a fraction. That's why you got the fraction bar with the two dots. The two dots represent the numerator and the denominator. That's not in there, in case anybody was wondering about that. So this is our, our, our main, our main uh, I guess, like molecule, if you think about it in terms of chemistry. And then we break it down, right? Now, how do we break it down? Now, we have options in terms of how to break it down. Now, one of the ways we could break it down is, now, if we, know, if we know addition, now, by the time we're doing division, our children should be very comfortable with addition already, even adding two-digit numbers, adding and subtracting two-digit numbers. So we could break 54 down into, let's say, I don't know, 18 and 36, because 18 plus 36 equals 54. Now, why would I choose those two numbers? Because we could break 54 down into a lot of different numbers, right? Because, I mean, we could break it down into like 51 plus 3, right? But I wouldn't do that. And the reason I wouldn't do that is because 51 is not divisible by 6. And 3 is not divisible by 6. 6 is divisible by 3, but 3 is not divisible by 6. So what you want to do is if you're going to break the first number down, which is called our dividend, right? You want to break it down into two numbers that are also divisible by the number, the divisor that you're given, which in, in this case is a six. So that's why I would choose two options for me would be 18 and 36. Because 18 divided by six gives me a whole number. And 36 divided by six gives me a whole number. 
So I do 18 divided by six. And then over here, I can do 36 divided by six. Now again, why? I always know why. I always ask questions. Why are those numbers? Why are we using those numbers? Because for one, for one, 36 and 18 add up to 54, right? And also, 36 and 18 are divisible by six. So you're going to get nice, neat, whole number answers, right? So if I say, well, what's 18 divided by six? Again, if we have our multiplication facts memorized, right? And we know that six times three is 18. We know that 18 divided by six is three, right? So what we've done is, it's like if you got 54 of something and you want to make six equal groups and you want to know how many people are going to be in each group, because that's what that's one way to look at division. 54 divided into six equal groups. And then if we do that, how many people will be in each group? So conceptually, that's what division is actually doing. That's what you're doing when you divide, right? Or you can think of it as like, if you got, I don't know, six children, or uh, you know, some, you know, six different children, and you got fifty-four dollars, and you got to split fifty-four dollars between each of them, or they have to split fifty-four dollars among themselves, and everybody's got get got to get the same amount of money. Then the question is, well, how much money do each of us get, right? So we could break the number fifty-four down into two smaller numbers, like eighteen and thirty-six, and then we have eighteen divided by six, which gives us three, and then we also have thirty-six divided by six. And 36 is a perfect square, right? That's something that you, your children will deal with soon enough, perfect squares. So 36 divided by six gives you six. So then you just add these two, these two partial quotients together. Partial meaning they're part of the main of the larger quotient. So we broke, we broke the, div, the dividend up into separate pieces. We got an 18 and we got a 36. And then the divisor stays the same. We still dividing them up into six equal parts. So if we divide 18 up into six equal parts, we get three. If we divide 36 up into six equal parts, we get six. So then you could just combine those, add them together, and three plus six is nine. Now, of course, if you know the division facts, you automatically know, you already know 54 divided by six is nine, right? But again, it's different things you're going to do and when you get to algebra class, you know, where they're going to be variables and exponents, right? Well, you're going to be doing the same thing. So it makes it easier when you see, when your children see that in algebra one, if they already are familiar with this method. Because you might say like, you know, well, if I know 54 divided by six, then why I got to do all this? Well, you don't have to necessarily. But again, it's about familiarizing you with different methods and different approaches. And it's about fluency. It's really about fluency, right? It's about understanding the relationship between numbers. And when you have fluency, your children are going to be more comfortable with numbers. And as you get more comfortable with numbers, then the math becomes easy. And then you start to develop confidence. And then, you know, you feel like, well, anything that I see in a math class, I feel like I can do it because I just, I just, I'm fluent with numbers. And you're like, when I see numbers, I just like understand them and I understand the relationships. And then I, and then you start to be able to like do calculations in your head, you know, of more complex math problems. Whereas, you know, you don't might not need a calculator. Whereas a lot of people, typical people might need a calculator, but then you don't need a calculator because you have that fluency. Let me check the chat. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you break it down, you know, 18 divided by six is three, 36 divided by six is six. Um, yeah, yeah, you know, and it because because this is what I want y'all I want y'all to think about. I want y'all to try to get like more methods, right? Have more methods, right? Than less, more methods. I'm telling you, it's like I know it kind of goes against the way a lot of us have been trained. I trust, I trust me, I was trained the same way. I had a lot of teachers that taught this is the one way to do it, right? This is how we do it, right? And that's it. Like once you learn this one way, that's all you need to know. And then so now for your children, if you have teachers that are teaching different methods. You know, I think a lot of us are relating back to, you know, how we were taught, which can be a problem. Right. Um, OK, 614. We still got to do fourth grade. Uh, yeah, see this. I'll mention this. We don't have time to do an example, but like, for example, five times four using an array an array and the distributive property. So this is something like when your children get the algebra and 
they are like multiplying by what are called binomials, like X plus five times like X plus three or X plus five times X minus four or something like that. They're going to use the, something called the distributive property. So if they understand it, you know, numbers, right, then it's going to be it's going to be helpful. You know, uh, once they see that. And then you have like problems where you have to insert parentheses in order to make the equation true. So this is like an order of operations problem right here. So 30 minus four times two plus five equals two. I'll kind of go, th go through this a little bit, spend a little time on this. So 30 minus four times two plus five equals two. So on the left side of that equation, according to the order of operations, you would have to do negative four times two first, right? So, but then that would give you the negative four times two would turn into a negative eight. Because a negative times a positive always gives you a negative, right? Negative times a positive is always a negative. So then you would have 30 minus 8, right, which is 22, and then 22 plus 5, which is 27. Of course, that does not equal 2, right? So this is something that your children will have to do in the third grade in the Eureka math curriculum. They'll have to learn how, where can I put parentheses? So this is like a game. It's like a puzzle, right? I got to figure out, like, where can I put the, the parentheses to make it make the equation true? Now, let's see what happens. Like, what if they put... um. 30 minus four, if they put the parentheses around 30 minus four, then that's going to be 30 take away four first. So let's say they did this. No, let me undo that. 30 take away four. We just kind of experiment with this. That would be 26. Then 26 times two is 52. 52 plus five is 57. So that doesn't work either. All right. Now, what if we did Put the parentheses around two plus five. So now if we put the parentheses around two plus five, and again, we're following the order of operations. Okay. So two plus five is going to give us seven. And then we have 30 minus four times seven. So now when we're doing order of operations problems, we're always and constantly thinking about, okay, what should I do next? Like, what is the proper order? So then I got 30 minus four times seven. And where did, the, where did seven come from? The seven came from doing two plus five. And we did that first. Why do we do that first? Because those numbers were inside the parentheses. And that's the order of operations. We work out everything in the parentheses first. So 30 minus four. So now I got a, I got a decision. Do I subtract first or do I multiply? We're going to multiply. So we got to do four times seven, right? Or we could treat it like negative four times seven. Negative four times seven is negative 28. So the 30 comes down because we haven't done anything with the 30, right? So the 30 comes down and now I got negative four times seven. So that's going to give me negative 28, which is the same as minus 28. And then we say, okay, equals two. Does that equal two? Yes, it does. So, but you notice how, you know, we did it a couple of ways. We did it a couple of ways and it's like trial and error. It's a trial and error method. We basically got it wrong at first or i got it wrong at first right but that's the that's the process right we go through the process we try different things you know and also what it helps is again it develops fluency and it helps us to reinforce the idea of order of operations right because we got it we need to know the order of operations so we don't end up you know being people that are you know on social media arguing about you know these problems that they post like every couple of weeks it's, a, it's the order of operations question and then half the people get it right, half the people get it wrong, but everybody thinks they're right, you know? So, but if you know the order of operations, um, and of course, make sure you understand that, on that note, PEMDAS is something that we're often taught, but the details behind PEMDAS is that just because the M is before the D in PEMDAS, you don't always multiply before you divide. You multiply or divide depending on what co operation comes first as you read from left to right. That's the thing, that's the part of PEMDAS that gets left out a lot. And I think a lot of teachers, even in when I was young and I was in school, left that out, right? Because it's multiplication or division, depending on what comes first. Be but, but because we learn PEMDAS only and not that detail, what we often do is we'll jump over division and go do the multiplication, thinking that we're following the rule properly, but actually we're not. 
because it's multiplication or division depending on what comes first. So just keep that in mind. All right, so let's go on to, the, to fourth grade. So let's clear the drawings. And all right, so place value charts. Yeah, place value charts is good because this is something I had. I had an issue with this because a lot of us, we probably learned back in the day that when you multiply uh, any number, right, by a power of 10, meaning like by 10, by 100, by 1,000, by 10,000, all you do is move the decimal point. So, and that's that's accurate. So part of one of the features of the new math, so to speak, is that, or at least the Eureka curriculum, they are, and this is fine, you know, this is this is not a not a big deal, but also, but I want y'all to be aware of the difference, right? Is that they are have they they would prefer for children to instead of moving the digits, well, no, instead of moving the decimal point, they want children to move the digits. All right. So let me give you a quick example. So, like this first example, 3,491 times 10. Right. So I got if I got a place value chart. Forgive me, this is going to be a little sloppy. Um, actually, you know what? Let's do this. Boom. So let's do. All right. So this will be my place value chart. Try to let's go back. And you got to do a couple. So if you got a child that's in. Um, Fourth grade, you've probably seen this already, this place value chart. Okay, there we go. There we go. Um, let's do this. T H O U and then hundred ten. And then one, it's the decimal point, tenth. Oh, you know what? No, let's do that. Let's do this. And then ten. So you gotta you set up the chart. And in the Eureka math book, you'll see the actual templates. They're already in there, right? Um, decimal point, tenth. And then we got hundredth. I spelled it. Let's fix that. Hundredth. Okay. So then we got, okay, let's do some lines. Gotta do some more lines in this chart. No, that's not the line of those. So line for in between 10,000 and 1,000, and then the line in between 1,000 and 100, then the line in between 110, line in between 10 and 1. And then this is the decimal point and the line between the 10th and the hundred. So again, like I said, like we probably learned it that when you multiply by 10, you move every number to the right one space because you 10 has one zero in it, right? So what they're now saying is this. Let me draw these shapes. So we got 3,400. 90, notice how I'm lining everything up by place value. 91, 91. And this is like what a decimal point is. So the decimal point is like stationary. So I grew up, I learned, just move the decimal point over. But now Eureka Math is saying, and again, it's not the end of the world, but it's just different. So instead of moving, the, if we're multiplying by 10, Instead of moving the decimal point, instead of moving the num every number to the right, we're gonna move it. We're gonna move every instead of moving the decimal point um, to the right, we're gonna move every number to the left. 
which get which ends up giving us the same result. So it's going to look like this. You'll, you'll see in the book, you'll see the arrows get drawn like this. Every number goes over one space if we're multiplying by 10. If we were multiplying by 100, every number would go over two spaces because 100 has two zeros in it. So you move over the same amount of spaces as you have zeros in the number. And then we also can imagine this was 3,491. There are no numbers, no digits after the decimal point. So therefore, we use zeros as placeholders, right? So since this one is moving over, you say, okay, well, what's in the ones place now? This zero. That moves over too. So now we got the three right here. The four is right here. The nine is right here. The one is right here. The zero is right here and now you know anything else after the decimal point is not really relevant but so we got 34,910 so 3,491 becomes 34,910 and with this method what happens is we're leaving the decimal point stationary we're not moving the decimal point now moving the decimal point is not wrong if we were to move the decimal point to the right, we would have still ended up with 34,910. But it's just another method. And this the reason, the logic, I think, behind doing it this way is because Eureka uses the place value chart to teach a lot of different concepts. So they want their children to become comfortable with the place value chart. And in terms of using the place value chart, they want to have certain parts of the place value chart stay stationary and to not move. And then other parts that will move. So instead, the digits will move. Now, I know like when they, when your children get to fifth grade, there's um, as an alternative to long division, they can actually do division by place value. Right. They can use a place value chart to do division. And that's something I never heard of. I just heard of that recently. And actually, I was a little excited by it because I'm like, wow, this is cool. It actually it's, this makes sense because I, and I think the thing I like about division by place value chart is that it allows the child to visualize what's actually happening when they're doing long division. Because I mean, I, I like long division. Like I said, I like long division. I learned it a long time ago and I like teaching long division. And I just, I tell students and I, I have videos on my YouTube channel about long division where I just repeat the concept, the rhythm, divide, multiply, subtract, drop the number down, divide, multiply, subtract, drop the number down. So you run out of numbers, right? But this division by place value is, is something that, you know, is really, you know, is really beneficial. So we have, we have three minutes left. So we have time to do rounding. We have time to do, let's do one more round 158.4 to the nearest whole number. Now in the Eureka curriculum, they use a vertical number line instead of a horizontal number line, which is what you'll often see a horizontal number line. So we draw your vertical number line like this, put an arrow at the top, Put an arrow at the bottom, right? Put a horizontal bar at the midway point. Put a horizontal bar near the top. Put a horizontal bar near the bottom. Now, the first thing we have to think about when we're rounding, whenever you're rounding, is that you only have two options. You're either going to go up or you're going to go down. So in this case, this problem, this example says round 158.4 to the nearest whole number. So whole number. So whole number means the ones place. Whole number means the ones place. So what number is in the ones place right now or what digit? A eight. So we can either, we only have two choices. We can either go down to 158 or we can go up to 159. If you look at 158.4, we can think of that like money, right? Imagine it was a zero after the four. That would be 158.40, right? That'd be 158.40. Um, so we got, so that's like $158.40. So if you had $158.40 and you had to round to the nearest whole number, you know you're either going down to $158 or you're going up to $159. Because 158.4 is in between those two whole numbers. So what you're going to do is at the top, you're going to write your upper option, which is 159. And at the bottom, you're going to write your lower option which is 158. 
Now, what goes in the middle? The halfway point. The halfway point is going to be like, think about it. What's halfway between one hundred fifty eight dollars and one hundred fifty nine dollars? One hundred fifty eight dollars and fifty cents. So we put one fifty eight point five right here. And whenever you do a do one of these number lines, well, we round using the vertical number line. We set it up just like this. Our two choices, one at the top, one at the bottom, and our halfway point right here. Then we go to the number that we're given. We're given 158.4. So then you have to ask yourself and think about it as like a uh, like an old school thermometer, like the old school vertical thermometer with the mercury at the bottom, right? Like where would 158.4 go? Would it go up here in between 158.5 and 159? Or is it less than 158.5? It's less than 158.5. So it's about like, like maybe like right here. So if it's right there, then you write the number. 158.4. So we got 158.4. So now the question is, okay, which number is 158.4 closer to? Whichever number is closer to, that's where you that's where you round to. We know that one we can see from the visual, and again, this is about visualization. A lot of times when we when we talk in math, as teachers, when we talk in math, it sounds like you know, blah, 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 right? But sometimes you need to be able to see a picture kind of like why when Instagram came out, it became popular because it was all about pictures. And as they say, a picture is worth a thousand words, right? So sometimes we can relate better to pictures or visuals, right? So this visual kind of shows me, because somebody, somebody could tell me, yeah, 158.4 is closer to 158. And I had to think about that. But if you show me a picture where I, I see how 158.4 is closer to 158, I see it with my own eyes. It's like, okay, so because it's closer, that's where I'm going to go. So I'm going to round down to 158. And this is how the book uses uh, the vertical number lines to round to the nearest whole number. So it's a little bit at the 630. Um, we're going to we're gonna stop right here. But definitely, uh, please... Go to the YouTube. I have a YouTube channel um, where I do videos like this um, on a lot of different topics. Um, it's all this math. So if you have the YouTube app on your phone, um, subscribe. Uh, have your children subscribe. Um, I also take video requests as well. So if you there's a specific homework problem that you're kind of stumped on, um, you know, reach out. You know, definitely, definitely reach out. I'll put my email address in the chat so you can have it. Um, yeah, because I really and I really like I'm, I'm hopefully I want like for teachers to use the YouTube channel. Um, I want parents to use it. I want the children to use it. I just want every I don't want math to be a barrier. Sometimes like so sometimes like what happens is, you know, because math is very cumulative, right? Math is like, you know, you can't escape the stuff that you didn't understand in the previous year because it's going to come back. Right. You're going to you're going to need to use it. So there's a, I have a lot. A lot of times the teachers in the next grade. In order for them to stay on task and on pace with the curriculum, they may not have time to fill in what we call learning gaps. So this is another reason that I created the channel. So I created the channel so that, you know, the parents and the children can work on the learning gaps on their own. So then when they go in, go into class, they'll be able to just, you know, be they'll be able to go with the flow of the actual curriculum in, during in class. Because if those learning gaps, if those learning gaps are not um, are not addressed, then they'll never be able to get the subsequent material. Right. It's almost like, you know, like just like, you know, building a house. You can't build a house if, you know, you don't have a foundation, you know. So, yeah. So, yeah, the link to the YouTube channel is also in the chat. Please go on the YouTube channel, um, subscribe, let people let other people know about it. Have your children know about it. And um, and yeah, you know, feel free. Like I said, my email address is also in the chat. Um, I'm also on social media. I'm on Inst Instagram, all this math, Facebook, all this math, TikTok, all this math. So, you can feel free to reach out with your math questions. And, uh, and yes, I, I do. I do one on one tutoring. Um, 
yeah, do one-on-one tutoring. Also do small group tutoring. But yeah, feel free to email me, contact me about that. Um, all the tutoring is virtual. And yeah, so yeah, we've been tutoring since, well, as a math teacher, I've been tutoring my whole career. But I started the company officially in 2017. And I've been tutoring since um, since 2017, you know, as a business, more officially. So, yeah, so I hope I hope everybody learns some things. And my, my goal is really like not necessarily for you to, um, you know, fully understand everything that I went over. But I want to, like, give you some confidence. And I hope hopefully you had some aha moments where you were like, oh, OK, that's all you got to do, you know, because it's that that's what I, that's what I hope for. Like, oh, that's all you got to do. Right. Because a lot of times when math is explained, it, it, it sounds real complex and it sounds real complicated. I try to simplify it and make it seemed very easy to do um sometimes when there are people that are i noticed this and i know we got to close the meeting out but um sometimes when uh people that are very proficient in math when they start talking they actually discourage people even more because the way they explain stuff it makes the other person makes the listener feel like oh like i could never know as much as you right just just because of the way that they talk the way that they explain it so i try to like really just let people know like you know that uh yeah it's not it's not that deep you know but it has to be explained in a certain way it does have to be explained in a certain way you know um do you have the list of properties used and the problem we went over so i think is the um is the recording I can go next. I'm okay. I can take a walk from here for you okay. to answer all these questions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but thank you guys so much for joining. We start the recording.